Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the Art of Trade Station. I am David Russell, VP of Market Intelligence here at Trade Station. I'm going to share a couple of links with you guys to get started. Hopefully, you can see them. Um, make sure you have the chat open in Zoom if you have any questions. Uh, you can ask them in there. Um, all right, we're going to be talking about finding opportunities in any market. Before we get started, let's read you a few disclosures. The following presentation is for educational purposes only. All symbols and trading ideas discussed by the instructors are for demonstrational purposes only and are not recommendations. This presentation is not an offer or solicitation of any kind in any jurisdiction where any trade station affiliate is not authorized to do business, including but not limited to Hong Kong or Japan. Active trading is not suitable for everyone. Options and futures trading carries a high degree of risk and is not suitable for all traders. Please read the disclosure information handout or the electronic disclosure information available on the Trade Station website. And I just shared that link with you guys. All right, great. So it's good to be with everyone. Um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to very quickly, I'm going to show you how to load uh, these indicators. So this is if you go on the first um, link I sent you, the zip file, um, this is what you're going to see when you download it. Um, the, the first thing you want to do is you want to go to this thing called the Easy Language Document. Now make sure you have TradeStation open. You double click on this and it's gonna try to import a series of indicators, which I have, so I'm not going to import them. So I'm just gonna hit cancel, but you would go ahead and import them. Some of these you guys may already have if you've been on my other webinars. The next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna open the, the two workspaces. Um, and this is the Art of TradeStation, this one. And then I have another one about the VIX. Uh, by the way, I also have the slides that I'm gonna be presenting, which is this right here. If you guys want to follow along, if you want to save these, there's some information here you might want to go back to um, after. And then I'm going to open this other one called VIX Spike History. Okay. All right. And then the, the, the main thing I'm looking to do here is talking about different ways the market behaves, trying to assess that, and then find ways to act upon it. So, <clears throat> you know, financial markets um, pass through you know, periods of different kinds of behavioral change. And what we want to try and do is laser focus on knowing what's going on. Don't think about so much why. Sometimes when you focus too much on the why, you start arguing with the market and that's never a good idea. So our goals are first to identify trends and second to position accordingly. You know, it's interesting because I wanted to quickly mention um, Mark Douglas, who's the, uh, the great trading coach, um, who, who died not terribly long ago, he had made the, um, the kind of observation, one of his rules is anything can happen in financial markets. And I think that's important for everyone to remember because you know most things we do in life, um, it's not possible anything happens. Your car cannot suddenly start talking. Well, now they can't talk to you, but you know, your car cannot you know, suddenly make coffee for you or you know, um, a toaster cannot suddenly become something else. You know, but in the market, anything kind of can happen. If you look back in history, you know, there was a time, look at a company like Penn National Gaming. There was a time that was a, an incredibly boring stock. Then they got involved in, in sports betting and it became a totally dynamic, heavily traded stock. The same thing used to be true of the financials before the financial crisis. There were incredibly boring stocks that no one ever traded. And then when the craziness started happening, they became trading vehicles. So it's important to realize that, you know, Anything can happen in financial markets, and that is different than other aspects of, um, of, of most things human beings deal with, which is why sometimes you need tools to kind of keep your head in the right place and focus on what's actually happening and not what you think should be happening. So um, as a kind of a little bit of a structure just to, to help guide and something I try and look at myself to know what I'm kind of where I'm going is a roadmap for my for my own kind of um, analyzing the market and, and, and taking different positions is to go through what I call the volatility cycle. So this begins, for example, when um, the market crashes like it did recently, and then fear drives up the VIX. Now, when that happens, correlation between stocks increases. Um, that basically means that if you're looking to be trading, it can make more sense to be trading the indexes like the S&P and things like that and avoiding individual stocks. When the, when the index is dominating, correlation dominates, um, at that point in time, it's harder to do stock picking. But then what happens after the, the market rebounds is that volatility drops and correlation declines. And that's when you wanna focus on stock picking. Then you can go through a period that can last for weeks, months, you know, even quarters sometimes of complacency. 
uh, in the market drifting higher and you know individual stocks moving and things like that. And then at a certain point in time, complacency yields another crash. And then we basically go right back to um, a, a correlated VIX driven market. And right now I would say that we're over in this spot right around here because you know we have had um, a pretty sharp sort of move in the VIX. Um, and actually, let me just go right now and show you this um, new kind of tool that I've kind of created. This is the VIX. Um, this is called the VIX spike history. And what I have here are three different things on this chart. First, we have the S&P 500 weekly chart. Then we have the VIX with Keltner channels. And then we have the one day rate of change. But because it's a weekly chart, it's a one week rate of change. And if you look at this, you'll notice that very often when the VIX breaks above the weekly Keltner channel like this, you'll notice from this moment in 2018, that was the high on the market for, you know, six, eight months. Um, you know, and at the same time, when, you know, um, at this period, you had a period there of about four to five months. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean it always goes that long. But the thing is, when you really see a volatility spike at this kind of strength above the Keltner channel, and this is, of course, the coronavirus crash, you know, you're usually looking at a period that is more kind of um, volatile and, and it can really last. And when the VIX goes up like that, again, it's all about correlation. So I wanted to mention that because, um, you know, right now, actually, I've written a few things. Let me show you my blog over on the um, on the trade station website. There you go. Here we go. All right. So if you go to tradestation.com and you click on insights, there's a few different articles I've written about kind of the state of the S&P now. Um, the first one I want to point you to is this one right here that we wrote on Monday. <clears throat> and in this article, we basically looked at the S&P 500 and we had kind of identified this September high and the 50 day moving average as an area to be watching for, you know, potential, um, you know, th is this the area where people are going to be looking? And that's pretty much where we took a dive down to yesterday and bounced today. So, um, you know, we have been watching this on the S&P. The other thing is we have this article about market breadth. I did a second article because I thought this was so interesting. See our related story on market breadth. Um, this was very dramatic in my view. Um, and what you see here, there's a few different things we've written about, but we really started noticing the, the, the weakening of the advanced decline in the S&P 500, even before the market crashed, more companies were making 52-week uh, lows. Um, and you started to see um, a lot of companies really falling under their key moving averages. Anyway, you can check out the articles yourself. And if you also follow through the link, uh, there's another webinar we did in July, um, which has a whole bunch of cool tools that you can also use for market breadth. You can get this workspace and a bunch of under interesting charts for the NASDAQ and the Russell. Um, it's a really powerful workspace I created for that webinar. So you might want to check this out um, and, and you can watch a webinar and you can download the tools. So that was one thing I wanted to, um, to just kind of mention um, because this is something at this time that um, I think we need to kind of be aware of. The other article is this thing about what's happening with the Fed. Um, I mean, you know, people are not really used to the Fed being hawkish the way it's going to be right now. If you look since August, they went from being like, we're never going to raise rates, inflation is transitory. And then they've been making this really sharp push in that direction. Every single event that the Fed has done has been skewed to ha toward hawkish since um, you know, August and especially recently, you know, um, when the last Fed meeting, they raised their inflation forecast, which is a sign of saying we're hawkish. Powell came out this week and said they might end tapering earlier and you know, they might end all stimulus earlier, which means rate cuts are going to come, rate increases are going to come earlier. So all of these things have swung in that direction of increased hawkishness. And I think it's important just to realize when you look at where the market is at, at this point after you know 18 months of, of steady gains, the idea of the Fed taking some of that away um, is potentially troublesome. And at the same time, you know, there's less participation to the upside. So I wanted to just mention that it's not necessarily an all out you know, bearish scenario. It is a situation though, where um, I think more volatility and more sideways movement could very much be the case. You know, we could see a period here of the market just kind of 
chopping around for several months. You know, we get deeper into the Fed, you know, um, you know, uh, tapering. And at a certain point in time, things might, you know, turn back. But I wanted to just kind of mention that because I believe based on some of the things we've seen, some of the evidence suggests that we're in a different kind of market than we were even just a month or so ago. And I think the main thing is not Omicron, it's the Fed. Um, before we move on, the other thing I did want to very quickly mention, because I'm, I'm watching it on my other screen and I want to let you guys know about it, is, is Ethereum. We're not talking about cryptos that much, but this is the Ethereum daily chart. Um, it's interesting. If you look at this high from the 20th, it held it today, and we have the eight-day exponential moving average coming up. We published some ideas on TradingView. Um, this is the TradingView chart with the trade station price feed. But anyway, I wanted to just mention this thing about Ethereum because it remains um, an interesting area to look. And you just take a step back and you think about it. There's this increasing adoption and engagement with cryptocurrencies. At the same time, people are looking at a lot of these major equities like, you know, that are a lot of these stories are relatively old now. And you look at things like Facebook and all these stocks that have had their stories that have kind of passed. They've had so many great quarters. Stock like Salesforce, major leader in the market, weak numbers this week. Um, you know, so it's interesting to think we could see a spot here where money starts shifting really from equities to cryptos. And just wanted to mention that as something to be aware of, because that's kind of what we're looking at here. What is the market doing? Everything I have is geared toward the stock market in this presentation, but at the end of the day, financial markets are financial markets. And um, I want to just emphasize that because it, we're in an interesting spot here with the Fed being active and cryptos, you know, pushing the upside with some of these stories coming out and people focusing on the Ethereum upgrade early next year. So these are some interesting trends to watch. All right. So these are samples of um, common market behaviors. On slide number six, I'm going to quickly zip through these before I start showing you some of the tools. See if you have any questions? Okay. So these are just types. I'm going to just run through this list. Um, so, like I mentioned, you have a risk off fear market. What we're looking to do is how do you diagnose it? And then what are potential ways to, to trade it? Not necessarily long or short. For example, when we're in a, a volatile market, you know, you, you can have the S&P tank one day and rally hard the next. It's not necessarily you want to just be short because that's you get some of the biggest rallies in a bear market. Um, or after sell-off, you get some of the biggest rebounds of all. And I know myself, and we've probably all done this, the market crashes, you buy some stocks you think are good, and then it snaps back and the stocks you liked didn't perform as well as the SPY. And that's my point. That's exactly what we're saying. At that time, you want to be focusing on the SPY because the stock picking is not the right strategy necessarily in, a, in an elevated volatility environment. Then we get into a period of complacency, which is just the opposite. Then we want then a potential way to look at it is when you're looking for um, the, the, the breakout stocks that are just kind of running and flying higher. And we had a lot of that last year when you looked at um, you know, some of the you know, when you saw the volatility really fading, you know, last year, you started seeing people buying some of the, 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 the much faster moving, um, you know, technology and growth stocks, things like NEO and, and Tesla and things like that, individual stocks that were working. But my point is, is when you're in a period of falling volatility and increasing complacency, that's when stock picking and following the breakouts can work better. Okay. Um, the market sometimes focuses on individual sectors. And in those cases, what you often want to do is look for the, um, you know, the, the, the potential response can be you want to, is to target the, the sector fund and then seek opportunities in the holdings of those funds. Now, one of the things in your zip file that I'm going to show you, but um, is an Excel spreadsheet with all kinds of ETF holdings. Um, so for example, if you're noticing like right now, and I'm going to show you how to find this, the areas that are strongest at present are semiconductors, consumer discretionaries, and home builders. Um, you can dig into those ETFs and look for opportunities. Now, you also have times when there's just this emphasis on cyclical growth. And that was what we saw, you know, after the vaccine news a year ago after the election. Everyone was buying the, you know, industrials, financials, interest rates rise. And very often it's going to focus on these kind of traditional, you know, just kind of smokestack old fashioned companies, things that existed in the, in the 1920s or you know, in the 1800s, things like banks, um, transportation, just the simple economic growth stocks. Those are the areas when you have the economy 
snapping back or accelerating where people focus and then they avoid very often, you know, your, your growth stocks, like a, a company like a Netflix or a company like a Zoom video, which trades at a higher multiple. Other times the market is focused on strategic events. Now, this has not been the case for a while, but often it focuses on biotechs and things like that. Now, I'm just listing these because I want you guys to keep these as um, as a reference. So then you can go back over time, maybe two, three years from now, when some of these things might apply. Th these things are kind of just overall behaviors that the market follows. That was slide nine. Um, the, the thing with this is you can look using radar screen and scanner, as I'm going to show you, to discover companies in the given industries. So for example, if there is strength in biotechs, there are ways you can just import a whole bunch of biotech stocks and start looking through that list so you know where to focus. Maybe you don't know biotechs, maybe you don't know industrials, but if that's where the strength is, you can pull that list in and focus on that using radar screen and scanner. Okay. Um, another trend that we often see is when the market goes through um, um, focusing on smaller companies versus the big companies. And um, you can do this in the, in the um, other workspace that I have. There's, a, there's some tools to do that. I'm going to show you how to do that. In fact, we're going to use that with method three, which is going to be on slide 14. Okay, so now let's dig into some of the actual um, use cases of doing this. I'm on slide 11. I'm going to jump over to the other trade station workspace. This was the VIX spike history. And now we're going to Art of TS, December 2021, Opportunities in Any Market. All right. This has four tools, four apps. It has radar screen and three different charts. They're all linked together. And we're going to start over here with our radar screen. And what this allows us to do, you'll notice it has two different tabs key ETFs and stock testing. I'm going to start with one called key ETFs. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. Now, these are all these different ETFs. They're going to allow you to basically understand um, different parts of the market with some of these kind of different um, indicators. Now, like I mentioned, semiconductors, consumer discretionaries, and home builders are strong. So how do I know that? Well, this is what I was looking at earlier. Um, right off the bat, if you look in 21 day or one month return, you can see. See, here are your cyclicals, like I said. They're the industrials, energy, financial, more traditional, old-fashioned companies. But then we have growth stocks like SMH, things like that. And if you look at this, it's interesting. The, the, the chips, even with the S&P 500, if you look at the S&P, it's down 1% in the last month, and semiconductors are up 9%. That tells you something right there. Um, so anyway, you can look simply down these columns, and you'll notice they're kind of grouped together thematically. Um, and then I also have down here the equal cap versus market weighting. Now, this is important because um, sometimes what you're going to see is you're going to see um, the, the the big mega cap stocks, you know, the FANG stocks, or whatever, outperform. And other time people are focusing on smaller companies. You can recognize that when SPY is outperforming RSP, it means the big caps are outperforming. And then... Um, uh, vice versa when RSP is outperforming because it's equal cap weighted. I've covered this a lot in other webinars. Um, I don't want to get into it too much now, but it's just one of the one of the other ways you can look at things. And then I basically have this whole list, all these that are up here, plus a bunch of others. I dump down here in, into like one big list. And then I also have country ETFs at the bottom. Right now, global has been pretty terrible. Um, so you can notice that you know all the global ETFs are lagging. But there are times when global outperforms and you want to have these on your on your on your um, you know references because there are times when you want to know about them. Um, the, the other thing I want to mention is you'll notice SPY is highlighted in this yellow and that allows you to compare everything. And you can see, for example, um, you know, in the last month, you know, home builders have outperformed, chips have outperformed. Um, and then there, there you can see the spies, consumer discretionaries have outperformed and everything else has underperformed spies. So you can quickly benchmark everything over different time frames to where it ranks up against the yellow um, line there for spy. Another tool I've created is called in range multiple days. Now this will take a period of time. It's defaults to 21 days and it will show you where is the stock in a range from minus 100 to 100. Um, and what that basically means is look at SMH. It's a 29%. So we'll take 21 days of history, which is probably right around here. It'll take the high and the low over that range. And it will say, where are we on a range of minus 100% to 100%. And if it's at the very top of its range, it'll have 100% as a value 
Um, it's fairly simple. But the nice thing about this is you can see things that are pushing their highs or pushing their lows. Um, very often, you know, when you're looking at some short-term trading, you might look for something that is near the bottom of its range, but is up a lot today for shorting. For example, there are certain times um, when, when something like IWM, for example, this would be something of a bearish signal when you see that it's you know, near the bottom of its longer term of its one month range, but it's up a lot today. And very often these are going to be the things that are spiking up against bearish momentum. Now, another tool that I wanted to show you, and we're still on slide 11. Let's make sure. So what we're doing here is we're sorting to compare across different time frames and other metrics. That's what I'm showing you, these indicators. This is a uniform method for assessing sectors macro themes and things like market cap type. Uh, now, I want to just mention that these ETFs are used as benchmarks and are not necessarily liquid trading products. A lot of those country ETFs I showed you are very illiquid. They're not necessarily, you know, um, any kind of thing that you want necessarily even think about trading, uh, but they are good as tools. And just as one little thing to think about, with TradeStation, you want to be careful because sometimes if you have different time frames or delays things don't always compare to each other. So ETFs are like, some people might not have the Russell. Some people might not have certain futures products. So I do this because everyone has equity you know, quotes so that the, the tools will work regardless. So this is one little thing to think about. You know, I've learned this by sharing products and using different accounts. You have to be careful sometimes when you include different types of asset classes because if someone doesn't have access to that data, it won't work. So there's a reason I use... ETFs for this. It's the same thing with other kinds of indexes. So um, anyway, I wanted to just mention that this is a uniform way to look across the market. You mean a growth market, um, a financial led market, anything. And this method using ETFs like this will almost always be able to help you see what's going on. So I, I look for something that's going to be uniform that you can consistently use over time. Any day you can flip it on, look at it and have a sense of where the market is going or you know, how the market is behaving. Now, one thing I did want to um, show you here, I have this one tool set up a certain way and I, want, I left it this way because I wanted to show you guys how to change it. This is a tool that shows, it allows you to see moving average crosses. So what this means when this says minus one on XLE, it means that the, that the 10 day moving average, simple moving average, and we're looking down here at this chart, it crossed under the 50 day one day ago because the reading is minus one. So this allows you to see when moving averages cross one over the other. Now I've done this sometimes, I look at the 10 day versus the 50. It's more interesting to look at very often the eight day exponential against the 21 day exponential. So I wanted to show you guys how to change this. This is one of my favorite tools that I've created and I wanted to show you guys how to optimize it or how to customize it for yourself. If you right click on it and you go to right, you're right here and you go to right click and you go to studies, edit, it's called MA cross bar since SMA EMA. And the reason why is because it can handle simple and exponential moving averages. So hopefully you can see this. You'll notice it has a fast MA length and a slow MA length. So I'm going to change that now to 8 and 21. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change simple. You got to have quotes for this. Exponential. Hopefully I'm spelling it right. That's the one thing about this tool. I could change it maybe to E and S, but for now it's, yeah, I'm just copied and pasted those. Now I'm going to hit OK and boom. Now it's going to change to simple and exponential. And now this is this chart up here. And that's the eight. And then the gold is the 21 on this chart. So you can see for something like this, the eight fell under right here. And if you look here for this, you can see it fell under eight days ago. Again, if we go back, this shows days since. You can see that semiconductors, risk on growth, these all are positive. The Qs are positive, but the IWM is negative. And that's exactly what um, you, know, you would expect to see. But this is just showing some of the different ways you can find um, similar things. One of the things that you might want to be thinking about doing, um, you know, for example, if the market does stabilize here and trying to start to move higher, is to start looking for things that have readings of two or three, because very often that means that the cross just occurred. At this point, when the markets tank like this, it doesn't tell us a huge amount, but it can be useful on the other side of, of a move like this. Okay. 
Another indicator that I have here I wanted to show, just make sure I'm looking at the right slide, is, um, is MA speed. What this will do is this will show the 50 day moving average and it shows the speed, like the rate of change of that moving average. And it can kind of you know, spot turns um, and, and help you kind of detect when, you know, when periods of strength are fading. I want to just kind of um, show this is just one other custom tool that I've created. You can double click on that. This one only does simple, but you can change the, um, the actual M, the moving average and also the average, which is this, the average of the, of the changes, which is the blue line. So there's another way you can kind of look across um, and, and assess different um, sectors and how they're performing. Okay, so that was slide 11. Let me just go back to this. All right, the other one I wanted to show is um, this. If I, I'm gonna just shrink this back to the way it belongs. This is a weekly chart. And what this allows us to do is this allows us, this is shows a ratio of different ETFs um, compared to the S&P 500. And what this shows you is, this shows you that the semiconductors have been gaining ground in the last several years against the S&P. And it shows you that something like, um, you know, the Russell small caps have been losing ground. And it's very interesting that you're often going to see these trends last a lot longer than you might actually realize. And, um, you know, very often, if you see something that's been trending lower, and it has like, some kind of rebound against that, very often it means that the it's kind of fading. So this is just an interesting way to uh, to basically compare any of these ETFs against the S&P 500 over the long term. And you can see the ones that are gaining um, relevance in the market and gaining overall um, um, market cap versus ones that are losing. Now, this is not an exact like representation that, um, you know, the that the energy is, for example, 12% of the S&P 500 because it's not, but it's just a benchmark that allows you to quickly see all on one screen. So from all of this, I think it's, um, hopefully you can see that with this tab and these three charts and these indicators, we can kind of quickly assess the short-term and the long-term prospects for a whole bunch of different sectors in the market. So that was looking at the higher sector level. Now what we want to do um, is looking at individual stocks and drilling down into individual stocks. So now we're moving on to slide 13. All right, now we wanna go, let me just make sure there's no questions. Looks like some people, you know, I think that I unfortunately recently had an upgrade to TradeStation. Did you customize your, I'm just looking at these. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on. If you don't understand, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to some of these questions I see. But um, the, unfortunately, I think that I might have just gotten a trade station upgrade and hopefully um, it's not going to, um, hopefully it loads for a lot of you guys. That's one problem sometimes when, when I get an upgrade on my workspaces, it doesn't always work for people who haven't gotten an upgrade yet. But still, if you, if you want to just at least follow along, here's the good news. The indicators will still work. You can load the indicators and you can use a lot of the same tools. Um, you know, um, if you load the indicators and then you basically, um, you just, you can just go and create them yourself. If you open a radar screen, you can then add the individual um, indicators um, on your own. But also if, um, you know, over time, if you have trouble with it, you know, I will actually email, I'm gonna add my email here. If you guys have issues loading it, drussell at tradestation.com. If you email me, I will, um, I will look into contacting some of the people in technical support who can help you. You can also call technical support and ask to have your your platform upgraded and they can you know put you on a on a list and then hopefully you'll upgrade it a day or two. I want to move on now. All right. So now we are going to do the next tab which is called stock testing. This currently has the S&P 500 in it. 
But what I'm going to do, I'm going to do select all and delete. And I'm going to go over to my spreadsheet. So I said SMH, semiconductors, had relative strength. So I'm loading this Excel sheet. And here's how you use it. Now, this was last updated. I update this every few months. Uh, it changes slightly. Some companies are added and removed. This was updated um, on the 15th of October. So it's still pretty up to date. If I do Control F, S, M, H, boom. These are all the holdings now of SMH. I copy them, take them over here. Okay. So by doing this now, I can basically rank them and quickly assess them. Um, I can look at, for example, in this group, if you want to look for stocks that have maybe pulled back, you know, if you want to, you can um, rank them over different time frames. Um, I'm just taking a quick look. Let's look at something like Xilinx. So Xilinx has been rallying here, and you can see in the last week it's down five percent. Uh, Skyworks. I haven't looked at this one. This one's been doing very badly. But even something like Advanced Micro Devices. This is very interesting. You have a stock that's been outperforming. You can see in the last month, it's up 18%. In the last week, it's down 4.5%. It's also interesting that here's my 21-day exponential moving average. Now, you'll notice that what do we have there? We have an indicator saying that it's touching the, 21, the rising 21-day EMA. This is a signal a lot of people use. So what's interesting about this is we can see here that the, the, the moving average sequence, the 8 is over the 21, that's um, a potentially bullish trend signal. And then at the same time, we have the stock, the low of the day was at the 21 day EMA. So this is a potential um, you know, signal that you could have generated using this approach just today. Now you can click on these different columns and you can, you can see here that you know, this was one with, with AMD. We can also look for the eight day. Um, Actually, I don't. I can change this. I don't have the eight day on this. But if you right click on this, there's another custom indicator I created. Um, you can change it now to eight, and you can look for names that are touching the rising eight day exponential moving average. We have a few potential signals there, like microchip, which is an interesting company. It doesn't get a lot of attention, but it's been actually. Um, I noticed this one recently. It's trying to kind of, um, you know, try to break out of this range that it's been in for a while. Um, and you can also see here um, that it's been touching that 21 day moving average here several different times and turning it into potential support. And here it was again today um, at, it didn't quite touch that one, but it's holding that eight day. So anyway, this one is just another way that you can you know, look for different um, potential opportunities. You can look also, right, I'm gonna, all right. So this was using the spreadsheet. You can do the same thing for um, ITB, which is a home builder ETF. If you go over to IT, you go back to the spreadsheet, control F, ITB. Here are the holdings, DR Horton, Lennar, just copy, delete, paste. Let's take a look at what we have. I haven't looked at any of these in a while, so this is all surprise to me. Lennar, for example, this would have triggered today. It would have triggered actually interesting. It would have shown the pattern back here on this kind of pullback. So anyway, the thing is, is that by focusing on the strong sectors, in many ways, it's it's because the market usually behaves by the overall sectors. People are focusing on the industries that where they see, you know, for some kind of appeal for some reason. Um, I don't want to get into the fundamentals of any industry right now, but if you're looking purely at price performance by using the first ETF, the first page, you can see where the strength is. And then the second page, you find the opportunities using some of these different tools. Now, this is good for more than just mining into the ETF. So I'm going to erase this, showing you how to use the ETFs. We can bring in the whole S&P 500 data, all symbol list, add the symbol list S&P 500. Excuse me, one sec. Okay, so it's loading the S&P 500. So like I mentioned, you can find pullbacks when it touches moving averages, and then you can find things like, um, 
the um, well, the 5D, that, that means like the one week, you can see the ones that are pulled back in the last week. You can see the ones that are touching different moving averages. MA test is a simple M and, um, moving average. Now, the other thing that's interesting is, like we said, all right, you want to look for, you know, semiconductors are doing well or whatever you think. If banks are good, whatever is going on, we have another se- column here called sector. So you can now rank. You can say, I want to see all the technology stocks. There we go. Now we've clustered them all together. And then you can say, you know, I only care about technology. So now you're going to go over and, and, you know, maybe erase everything above. Right. And then everything below that's not technology. And then you can basically. There we go. And now you can do similar sort of analysis. And you can say, hmm, let's see all the tech stocks today that pulled back to the 50-day moving average. And what do we get? We get Cognizant Technology is interesting. That's a stock people don't think about very often. For some reason, Eaton is considered a tech stock. It is, I always thought of as an industrial. But you see some of these different stocks now are kind of pulling back um, to the to like their 50-day moving average. These are a pattern that are potentially sort of, um, you know, the thing that some people might be looking for. Um, so I'm going to go back to the overall S&P now. But the key thing is, is that you can basically mine companies inside of the S&P 500 by using the sector um, column. Another thing you can do is you can now go to data, add symbol list. I got to remember how to do this. I don't do it often, but there is other thing, other symbol lists. And then we have something called Reuters symbol list and we have industry groups. And then you can say, hmm. Let's look at technology. And then you can say, I'm really interested in semiconductors. You can look at these different groups, right? I'm really interested in semiconductors. Okay, boom. It's a different list. There's going to be a lot of similarities, but there will be some different ones. Not everything is necessarily in the SMH, for example, but this is a way to find similar um, similar things. And it's all built in the trade station. So, um, Again, if you're focused on a certain area, um, this now all these same things are going to be in effect and you can dig around in the same list. You can do other things, for example. You can go to studies, add study. You can say, I only want to see stocks that are a certain market cap. You can then say, like, you can start typing, M, you know, for market cap, MA, and then where is it? Market cap in million. You can just change that if you want. Boom. And then we can say, all right, I only want to see the big ones. There we have a bunch of our big stocks. You can then go and eliminate the ones that are smaller or whatever you want. So there's a lot of ways you can do this within TradeStation by working with the ETF list I gave you, by working off the S&P 500 and following the, um, the sector column. You can also add the industry column, the study, which um, is similar. Industry is more detailed. So something like, um, you know, semiconductors are in industry and technology would be the sector. So um, I, I, for safe space sake, I didn't do that, but you guys are, everyone has industry as a study. If you just type IND, here it is, industry, we can bring it in, boom. Again, I don't want to waste too much time on this. I wanted to show you guys how to do it. Everyone has access to this. Um, I'm going to just for the sake of space, not even bother with it and move on to the next thing. Which is, let's take a look at some of these actual indicators now. All right, let me just make sure I'm going right here. So the next thing is, is, um, let me first explain. There's a few more things on some of these indicators. Again, we have these these crosses, right? So you can look now, again, in a market like this and everything is just crashed, it might not mean as much. But like, in say the market stabilizes, drifts around, um, you know, and you start to see, you know, interesting, you know, certain stocks now maybe have, and in fact, this was one that that I've been watching recently, Donaher. This is a very interesting company that that has been a, a leader for a long time and not a lot of people pay much attention to it, but it's interesting when you look at this pattern here, it's consolidated here for um, you know several months 
Um, this is a company that makes medical devices and different kinds of, um, it's technically a medical, a healthcare company, but it's kind of like an industrial company. If you want to read its story, people call it, it's kind of like the, the, the Berkshire Hathaway of healthcare or something, but um, it's been a very successful sort of, um, you know, name for a while. It's interesting here. We have a stock that it recently had the cross. So what one of the things you might, people might want to be kind of doing or thinking about doing in the next few weeks is, all right, well, here's the market. Um, it's stabilizing after a big pullback um, or, or something like that. Let's look for names that recently had the crosses. And so you can do now is you can say, all right, let me find everything where the value is between zero and 20. And that would mean that the moving average cross had appeared in the last 20 sessions. And then, you know, you can then erase everything above and below, and then you can sort that list again. And then you can, you know, start looking for potential opportunities. This would show up for a few different reasons because it has the, the bullish patterns here, but at the same time, um, it has, it's down in the last week. So this would pop up a series of different ways, um, potentially on the chart. Then you look at something like Moderna. It's interesting to look at it. See, this one just had that crossover. I've been watching this stock for a while. This is really a emerge as a very interesting and volatile stock. Um, I'm not sure what to make of it here. I mean, you have that signal, but there's also been um, a pretty significant, you know, pullback in it. And um, it's interesting to see that it did recently have that cross. Anyway, this is a tool that you can really work with. And remember, you can adjust it. And the interesting thing about it is you can compare even simple and exponential moving averages to each other. You can do quite a lot. This is an interesting tool. It's one of my favorite things I've created, and I'm happy to share it with you guys. Another thing you might want to look at are stocks that are near the 52-week high, especially when we have the market like it is now with a lot of stocks. The S&P 500 is you know, obviously far off its high. Very few companies are hitting new 52-week highs in a market like this, but you have some housing stocks that are. NVR doesn't trade very much, but it's a, it's a home builder. SHW, Sherwin-Williams, hitting a new high. These are not necessarily very interesting, but they're home. these are stocks that are hitting highs. Um, just interesting to kind of look at this list. Um, you know, key, this is an interesting stock as well. A stock like, um, like Keysight, which does technology for 5G, which is continuing to build out. Um, still a lot of places that hasn't been finished yet. So this is just um, another interesting name to, to notice that the market sells off and this thing doesn't do much of anything. I also want to mention that these crosses down here show when the stock hits a new 52-week high. It technically shows new highs on the chart, but I have the chart set. If you go to data, edit symbol, you'll notice it's set to one year. So basically, if it has a cross, it means that it made a new high in the trailing, you know, in, in the actual year of history. So if you're seeing crosses recently on the chart, the white crosses, that means it's hitting highs as well. Now, um, distance from 52 week high can be interesting because in a market like this, it can be interesting to look for the stocks that are maybe 5% off their highs when the overall market is, um, is, is further off. And you can just kind of look down the list and start assessing some of these names. This would be one of the ways you can, you know, that you can potentially consider um, you know, looking for pullbacks um, in stocks that are not, that have not, you know, gotten hammered the way some of the, like energy or financials have gotten hammered or they're near their lows. These are stocks that have pulled back very mildly. They made highs recently. Um, and this bout of volatility in the market is simply for them, um, you know, a, a pullback. Very often the stocks have performed the best in the weeks after the pullback when the snapback occurs and people start shifting from the indexes are the companies like this that didn't pull back very much at all, that didn't have a lot of selling pressure. These are often the names that will perform well. And that's why I want to show you this other indicator, which is called PX versus MA. Now, I apologize for some of these having such weird names, but I like to keep my columns very tight. So this shows the current price versus a moving average. And so, for example, if you click on it, this is going to show, in this case, where the stock is in relation to its 50-day moving average. Um, and you can change the indicator, or the, the moving average. In this case, it's set to the 50. So NVIDIA, and the whole S&P 500, NVIDIA is farthest above its 50-day moving average. Now, in and of itself, this indicator is not always 
the most meaningful because if a stock is more volatile, it could be a lot higher against its moving average. It's not necessarily in and of itself massively meaningful. But what's interesting is, say, for example, we go into a bigger period of, of a correction or some kind of deeper correction in the market. It could be interesting to see the stocks to change this, for example, to 100 day moving average and to look at the stocks that are near the 100 day. Now, I do that because one of the things that I had kind of looked at, and I wrote an article about this way back when the market was um, you know, recovering. In fact, I don't even have it. Let's see if I even have this on here. All right. So this is C, which is, it was one of these Kathy Wood stocks. And um, it was basically, if you look back to March, all right, this does not have the 100 day moving average on it, but the 100 day moving average was like right here on this stock um, at the time of March of 2020. The S&P was like miles below its 200 day. And here you have this stock sitting at the 100 day moving average. After that, it went from 35 to 300 something. What this showed is it basically showed that the sellers didn't want to sell the stock very much. Um, so this stock now is showing some real exhaustion, potentially, you look at this. But what's interesting is, is when you can see stocks in a bearish market that are above, say, the 50-day or above the 100-day, kind of depending on how violently the market is sold off. So this tool can help you also kind of assess you know, relative strength in the market. It's not necessarily good to just look, wow, this one's up this so, this high because this is very often going to be less than it might be overbought. But this tool can be useful in a bearish market to find the names that are not way below the moving averages. It can also be interesting to find stocks that are near the moving average, but are not necessarily on top of it. So like some of these stocks, for example, are kind of near their moving averages. Um, not necessarily something that's as valuable. I meant I included this mostly to find the stocks that are that are ha hanging in in a bad market. Okay. So, even in bear markets, the method 3 now is to look for pullbacks and breakout stocks. Kind of similar to what we were talking about, but there's a way you can look directly for them. Even in bear markets, certain stocks may be trending higher. Simply targeting those can help traders outperform. So what we're going to do now is we're going to use Scanner. I'm going to go to Scanner, which is a different app. I have to go and create it, open it. It's the little flashlight. All right. I'm going to just create a new one. Let's just call it like um, December 2 you know, demo. All right. I call it breakout. Breakout. All right. So you have to name it. You're going to go to including. Now, this is a uh, slide. 14. These are the steps we're going to go through using Scanner. We're going to include all stocks. Then we're going to go to the next and we're going to say, I have this set. I'm going to remove these. I have these set as defaults. So I'm going to show you how to do it. Just go to volume, volume average 10 day, greater than 500, say, one, two, three. And this is going to eliminate like kind of illiquid stocks. We're going to go then to market cap of at least 5,000, 5, which is 5 billion. We're going to go to capitalization, market capitalization greater than 5,000. We're going to go to the price bucket. Price. We're going to go to percent of 52 week high low we say greater than 90. this does the same thing there's my price range except it takes the 52 week low the 52 week high and then it looks on a scale of zero to 100 where are you in that range and then the last trick is we're going to go to price low the low less than and this is kind of the special trick. Moving average exponential. Now there's an indicator. So we go to indicator. You'll notice here, I'm sorry, just to show you. These buckets are all pre-calculated in scanner, all these little folders. But you go down here to indicator. This will have to be calculated. So now we're going to go to moving average exponential. We're going to say less than the moving average exponential but we're gonna open it up and make sure, I wanna set it to eight. If you, again, 
my email I have shared, drussell at tradestation.com if you have any other questions. Hope everyone has a great day. Don't forget to check out Market Insights for more. And you can also sign up for our newsletter. So it's great to be with everyone. And um, have a great day and good luck.